we can all find our seats. All right, it's definitely awesome to see everyone here today as we worship our Lord. And as a reminder, if we could all silence our cell phones so that worship is not disturbed, that would be great. And before we begin, we're going to have a reading from the 46th Psalm. Well, psalm 46, we'll read the psalm in its entirety, and I'll be reading from the NASB. Psalm 46, God the refuge of his people. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling cry. There is a river whose streams make, the, make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations make an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He raised his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Who has wrought desolations in the earth? He makes wars to cease the end of the earth. Cease to the end of the earth, sorry. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. You end the reading of the word? Amen. Amen. Let's go before God in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. We thank you for the reminder of, from your word that you are our refuge in a time of storm. Despite circumstances that surround us, you are our present help. And I pray that this reminder would be reinforced throughout the remainder of worship today. I pray that regardless of what we may be going through individually, collectively, we would be reminded that you are our shelter in the time of storm and that we can rely upon you. When man fails, you are always there for us. So please help us to bear that in mind. We pray for those who um, may still be on their way here, that they would arrive safely, and that all uh, present during worship today would be uplifted and encouraged. So again, Lord, we commit the service into your hand and pray that it would be pleasing and acceptable to you. We love you and ask this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Shall we please stand? We glorify God for another beautiful day. We are going to sing songs to worship him for his great. Uh, so please, if you have one close to you pick it up the binder we're going to sing from this book today let's open to page seven singing psalm 34 <coughs> psalm 34 page seven <laughs> I saw the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on Him are radiant. He'll never be ashamed. He'll never be ashamed.
Goodness of God. 
Amen. After this song, we invite Brother Van to lead us our first prayer. Um, page 14. Behold our God. Behold our God. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Father, for being faithful all of our lives. Please give a speaker today, Father, the words that will edify us, uh, open our hearts, open our minds, Father, to receive the message, to receive your word, and let our worship service be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we please be seated? Thank <laughs> you. 
let's open it to 10, page 10. Bow down before the Lord. Page 10, Psalm 95.
shall sing our last short song before we invite our Bible reader. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. vision of Obadiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise up, let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, Who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If these came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. They would, not, <clears throat> would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasure pillaged, and all your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut up, will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof with strangers, while strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster nor gloat over them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they never had been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire and Joseph a flame. Esau will be a stubble and they will set him on fire and destroy him. 
There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the lands of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as our brother Daniel said, we are in awe of you. We are so small. Um, your word is so powerful. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the brethren, of brothers and sisters who share the word with each other, who challenge each other with the word, who talk to each other about the word. Please uh, help us understand this message of Obadiah through our brother Caleb. Please help him to uh, speak with uh, authority and strength uh, coming from you, Lord, as your son did. Help us to understand the word and to, if we are convicted, to face our own needs and our own mistakes and our own blemishes that we have. We all have them. Let us become clean for you, O Lord. Let this, let this uh, reading and sermon help us to do that. It's in your son's name we pray this. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is certainly good to be together and to worship our God, to come into his court and shout for joy to the Lord, to praise his name with gladness. It is a gift to be together and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. One mistake I made, though, uh, I did not drink any water this morning. And after worship like that, I may need some. Uh, Sister Joy... There's a cup over there. If, I'll get, I'll if you'll get, I'll get, grab, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. We're going to be in the book of Obadiah, <laughs> if you're not there already. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, go ahead and get your Bibles there. We're going to spend most of our time here. We've been looking uh, this year, uh, once a month, at uh, the Minor Prophets. I've entitled this Minor Prophets, but Major Mission. Um, and that's because even though they are short in length, thank you both. Um, even though these these uh, messages are short in length, short enough that I can ask a brother to read the whole book uh, <laughs> before we get up, before I get up here, um, they have a major message and a and a major mission that God had given to His prophets. Um, you'll notice in verse one that uh, these prophets were God's envoys to the nations. Um, they were sent by God to the nations with a very important message. Um, now, most of these prophets uh, were sent primarily to Judah and Israel. In fact, six of the minor prophets, six of the twelve, um, ministered to Judah primarily. We looked at Joel already, and Joel ministered primarily to Judah. Um, others ministered primarily to the northern half of the kingdom, that would be Israel. And let me just point out that as I'm telling you about the northern and southern kingdom, that should remind you that this is a very dark time in Israel's history. This is a time where the kingdom is split apart, where it was not the way God intended it to be. And it became that way because of sin. It became that way because of pride. It became that way because of evil that ran rampant. Um, but then there were some other prophets who ministered to both Judah and Israel. Hosea is an example of that. We looked at Hosea first. Um, but each of these prophets had a major mission. They were driving home a major truth that God desired from his people. With the book of Hosea, if you'll remember in January, we looked at the book of Hosea. Hosea's message to the people was that God wanted his people to be loyal, faithful, and true. With the prophet Joel, he called the people of God to call upon the name of the Lord. And with the prophet Amos, again and again, he called the people of God to be a people filled with justice and righteousness. 
Today we turn our attention to the prophet Obadiah. We don't really know much about him. There's a few different Obadiahs uh, in, in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, this one, it appears, is only mentioned here in verse 1. So we don't really know much about him. Um, but Obadiah is one of the prophets that ministered to other nations. He's an envoy sent not to Israel or Judah, but to other nations, and in, in particular to the nation of Edom. The nation of Edom was southeast of Israel. It's what today would be, um, it would be part of today, um, what would be modern Jordan. Um, and, and the nation of Edom was a kingdom that descended from, uh, do you guys, anybody remember where? Esau. He came from Esau. Um, these were the descendants of Esau. Genesis chapter 25 tells that story. Um, and, uh, and they uh, not only were descendants of Esau, but just like Esau was constantly at enmity with his brother Jacob, um, the descendants of Esau were constantly at, en at enmity with uh, their uh, cousins, their cousins, uh, Israel. Over and over again, we see this happen. Um, do you guys remember in the book of Numbers, uh, Israel had come out of Egypt and they're trying to cross into the promised land. And they come to the borders of Edom, and Moses sends messages. And he says, hey, please, we're not going to touch anything. We'll, we'll pay for anything we do touch. We'll cover, we'll, we'll cover all expenses. We just need to pass through your land to get to the land that God has given us. And you remember what Edom said? No. no. They asked, Moses asked the second time, pleaded with them, just let us pass through. No. And Edom actually sends out a wall of warriors to make sure. They're going to build a wall to make sure that nobody is passing through their land whatsoever. Um, and so Esau is constantly at enmity with Jacob. The descendants of Esau are constantly at enmity with the Israelites. Um, you remember in 2 Samuel that David actually, once he secures the kingdom, he conquers Edom and subdues them. They are submissive to David. Um, but there's this constant enmity that, that happens between the two. Now, when we pick it up in the book of Obadiah, Obadiah What's happened is that Israel has been punished. Judah has been punished for their wickedness. They've been punished. And now um, Edom has seen this as an opportunity to take advantage. Edom has seen this as an opportunity to take advantage of Israel's vulner vulnerabilities to plunder them even more. So in their time of, of injury, uh, Edom comes along and adds insult to injury and some more injuries as well, taking advantage of exploiting those who are in trouble, and even even uh, even causing more punishment uh, and more pain and more death to the people uh, of God, to the Israelites. Now, remember, this punishment that came on Israel and Judah was is inflicted by the Lord. It was a punishment because of their own wickedness. But Edom took sometimes, and this is what often happens. Sometimes, uh, even when God punishes, people decide to punish more, and they decide to cause more trouble. More affliction, uh, more punishment than even what God had intended. And for that reason, God has a message for Edom, and it is a message of judgment. The day of the Lord is near for all the nations. But what is it about Edom? What is it about Edom that God hated? What is it about Edom that, that, that made God so angry with them? Um, what is it about God that, about Edom that made God decide that he would make this nation small among the nations and utterly despised? And the answer is pride. The answer is pride. What Edom needed, what God desperately wanted from Edom and also from Israel and Judah and from every nation upon earth is he wanted humility. Humility. Minor prophets, but a major mission. And the prophet Obadiah was sent to teach both Edom and and all the nations who would read this, even still today, to teach us humility. All right, I want to talk to you today about the danger of pride. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about manifestations of pride in us. And then we're going to talk about um, habits of the humble. Habits of the humble, all right? The danger of pride. Look with me first at Obadiah Verse 2, Obadiah verse 2. See, I will make you small <coughs> among the nations. You will be utterly despised. Well, why is God deciding to make, uh, to make Edom small among the nations? And the answer is because Edom has become big in their own eyes. Edom has become big in their own eyes. Look at verse 3. The pride of your heart 
has deceived you. Edom has become proud. And if you want to, if you want to know the best way to make God angry, the best way to make God furious, it's right here. Haughty eyes. Do you guys remember this from the Proverbs? We're studying the Proverbs. Proverbs 6 and verse 16 and 17. What are the things that God hates? At the top of the list, haughty eyes. God hates pride. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. James 4 and verse 6 says, God resists the proud. And we know this is true. We know this is true from history. Do you guys remember the story of the Tower of Babel? How did it work when man says, I'm going to make a great name for myself? God said to Abraham, I'll make, a great, I'll make of you a great name. God wants to give his people a great name. But when man says, no, I'll do it my way, I'll, I'll, we'll make a tower that reaches to the heavens, we'll grow. What does God do? God cuts the tower down. And God takes those who are lofty and he lowers them. And he takes those who are bowed low and he lifts them up. God humbles the proud. He opposes the proud. Do you remember Pharaoh in the book of Exodus? We don't have to go far. In the book of Exodus, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? Well, look, the, well, Yahweh gave him a 10-course lesson on who he was. Ten plagues. One to teach him each different part about himself, about Yahweh, and how great he was compared to their gods that they were worshiping. God has a way of humbling the proud. And this is important for us to, to recognize because um, you, you might think of it this way. There are two plans. You can either humble yourself before the Lord or the Lord will humiliate you. And I'd like to be working so hard on plan A that the Lord doesn't have to resort to plan B. Do you guys remember Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon? Do you remember him? Became the king. And is this not the great Babylon that I have built? What did God do to a king so great that he had conquered the whole world? He laid him low like a beast of the ground, like a brute beast before him. God humbles the lofty. And in fact, that's what happened to Judah and Israel that led Edom to think, hey, this is our chance. This is our chance to take advantage. Now, I should have said another thing about Edom that you should know, and that is that the people of Edom uh, were in a very secure location. You can visit today. It's actually a tourist attraction uh, in, in Jordan that many people go and see, a city called Petra, um, and uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's in the Red Rock Canyons, and you've got these beautiful, almost like palaces that are built into the rocks. It reminds me, when I look at it, it reminds me of the, the, uh, the beginning of the Star Wars trilogy um, when the, the Tusken Raiders are coming out of those like mountain you know, side canyons and stuff, and they're hiding. And that was the idea. Um, you see this in, in, in verse uh, 3. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home upon the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down. And this is important. Um, Edom was in a very secure location. It was a very difficult place to attack. And because of that, and because of that, the people became deceived into thinking that they were secure. They were secure. They live in the heights. We live in the clutch of the rock. We're in a safe location. And by the way, is that not a timely message for us? We who live in the clefts of the rock, we who live in the heights, crown heights, isn't that what they call this? Um, prospect heights. We who think we live in the greatest city in the world. Is this not a message for us? Yes. It is a message for us. It is tempting sometimes for us to think because of where we live or because of who we are or because of what we have, that therefore we are secure, that we are okay. And the, the message to the Edomites is a, a sobering reminder that there is no cleft high enough. There is no fortress strong enough. There is no, there is no nest that reaches even to the stars that God cannot bring you down. God is not limited. By his, in his strength. God is not limited in his power. Therefore, we must recognize our place before him. Though you soar like an eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down. God's eyes are on the haughty to bring them low, David prayed in 2 Samuel 22 and verse 28. But I just want you to think about for a moment, why is it that God hates pride so much? Why, why is the Bible so anti-pride? Why is God 
Uh, why, why is this the thing that makes God the most angry of all thing, all the sin that God hates? Why is pride always at the top of the list? And I think the answer for this is that pride, when, when I am proud, I am seeking to steal for myself the glory that God alone deserves. Isn't that right? Pride is me seeking to steal for myself the, the glory that God alone deserves. Somebody described it as cosmic plagiarism. It's taking something that is God's alone and saying, I authored that. That came from me. Um, and that's way, that's a serious, serious thing to do. I think it was C.S. Lewis who described pride um, having many forms, but one in self Glorification. That's what pride is. It is glorifying me. It is magnifying me. It is, as he said, a telescope turned the wrong way. It, it magnifies self and makes the heavens small. Isn't that what pride is? And this is why God hates it. It is the, it is the complete anti-God state of mind. A mindset that says, I am what matters. I am what is important. I am the center of the universe and not God. So God hates pride, and therefore we need to be attentive to it. But let me add to that, that another reason why pride is so dangerous is because it's so deceptive. Look at this in verse 3 again. The pride of your heart has deceived you. It has deceived you. Now, let me tell you, I don't know about you, but I can only speak for myself here. I'll just tell you, I don't have a real difficult time uh, discovering pride in other people. Um, it's, it's pretty easy sometimes to, to see it in other people, um, for me at least. Um, uh, now, I may not always be accurate in my perceptions there, but I feel like I'm probably not the only one um, who, who, has, who, who feels like, you know, we can see pride in other people. You know, you see, you see some guy running down the court after he hit that three to win the game in, in the playoffs, and you see him dancing like that. We're like, yeah, that guy's really proud, and the Lord's going to humble him one day, you know, right? Uh, we, we can see it in other people. But here's the, here's the sneaky part about pride. It's really difficult to detect it in yourself. And I don't know why that is. But I can tell you it's all over the Bible that people who were extremely proud had a really hard time recognizing it. You know, do you think, do you think Pharaoh recognized how proud he was? Do you think Nebuchadnezzar did? Not until the Lord humiliated them. And this is the problem. Pride is so sneaky. It blinds us. It blinds us. Uh, to every other sin. Uh, it is so deceptive, and it's much easier to see it in other people than it is in ourselves. Somebody said this, um, Lou Priolo uh, wrote this, and I found this so helpful to me. He said, the sin of pride carries with it God's swiftest and most severe judgment. It blinds you to other sins in your life, and it hinders you from repenting of them. He said, pride is the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or the AIDS of the soul. When a person dies as a result of acquiring AIDS, he doesn't really die of AIDS. Rather, he dies of an AIDS-complicated illness, like pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis. Not unlike a cataract, um, the AIDS virus somehow blinds the eyes of its victim's bodily defense system. And this prevents his autoimmune system from seeing and consequently destroying those deadly viruses and bacteria that ultimately kill them. Like AIDS, pride blinds you, not only to itself, but to every other sin tucked away in the recesses of your heart and life. It causes you to hate correction and reproof. It hides, you, it hides your sin from you. It justifies your sin. It excuses your sin. It keeps you from repenting of your sin. It deceives you into thinking that you are spiritually well, when in fact you have a deadly cancer and are in desperate need. Is that not true? Pride is sneaky, and it is deceptive. And therefore, it's important for us to consider not only how dangerous pride is, but how pride might be manifesting itself in our own lives. And before I go to that, I just want to say, the reason pride is so dangerous is exactly what was said to Edom in verse 15 is what we need to recognize as well, and that is that the day of the Lord is near for all the nations. The day of the Lord is near. Just as the day of the Lord has come again and again throughout history and God has humbled and humiliated nations that became proud, we should expect that the, Lord, the day of the Lord is coming again. In fact, we know for a fact 
that a final day of the Lord is coming. There may be many other days of the Lord that come before that. But a final day of the Lord is coming in which all of the nations will give an account to God. And on that day, we know that the ones upon whom the Lord will look, that he will fix his gaze, are those who are humble in heart. And all who are proud and all who are arrogant, the Lord will, will lower the lofty and he will exalt the humble. So pride is dangerous. So if it's so dangerous, though, what can we do to make sure that we are not guilty? What can we do to ensure that it, pride doesn't get a hold on our heart? I want to give you some manifestations of pride, some manifestations of pride. And I'm just giving you a few here. Um, you're going to have to search your own heart. Uh, I, I'll just tell you in advance, I'm pretty sure every single one of these I've been guilty of at some point in my life. And some of them I'm probably guilty of at this present moment. Um, but that's why we're talking about them. It's so, so that our hearts can, can become more aware to recognize pride as it comes. And this is the challenge about pride. Um, uh, pride can morph. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, you can address it in one area. You can recognize, oh, I'm being proud in this way. And you can address it there. And the next thing you know, it comes in the back door. And there it is over here. You know, Pride is really sneaky in that way. And so we have to continue the work of attacking pride. And pursuing humility. That is always going to be an ongoing work for the people of God. To continue to attack pride and, and remove it from our hearts and replace it with humility. So let me tell you uh, some manifestations of pride uh, that I've noticed in my life and I've noticed in, in our hearts and our heart, in, in our life. Um, one, this is a symptom of pride. If I have a hard time with, with thanksgiving and gratitude. Um, if you have a hard time finding time to give thanks to God. If that's not a really important part of your prayer life, if that's not something you do uh, just on a on a day to day basis, if that's not something, if, if somebody asks you, hey, can you lead a prayer of Thanksgiving, and you can only come up with two or three things on the list, like that's a pretty good sign that there may be some pride going on in your heart. And here's why I say that: um, a, a proud person thinks we deserve what we have. Um, in fact. Proud people often, this is coupled with a lack of gratitude, grumbling and complaining. Proud people are often grumbling and complaining. Well, why? Because we think we deserve better than what we have. And we forget that actually every good thing that we have, we do not deserve. It is only by God's grace that we have what we have. And so we become proud and therefore we think we deserve it. So we don't think we need it to say thank you for it. And that's, this is true, not just, uh, sometimes it's true in the way we treat each other. You know, somebody does something good, we don't say thank you. You know, somebody, somebody takes care of us, somebody helps us in some way. And I, I know I'm guilty of that. There's so many of you I should be thanking every day for so many ways in which you care for us and, and have cared for me and Lindsay over the past few weeks and months. Um, but, 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 but there's a heart that seeks to give thanks to God, that shows a spirit of humility. And there's a heart that says, you know what? I really, I deserve what I have. Therefore, I don't really need to give thanks. Of course, we would never say that with our mouths, but we say it through our lack of thanksgiving, the lack of practicing the discipline of gratitude and thanksgiving. I should add to that, um, and I'll just say this here, prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Where does that come from? When I, when I go run around doing everything that I want to do without praying, what am I saying? I'm saying, God, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. And when I wake up in the morning and I fall to my knees and I say, God, I need you. I mean, I say it with my lips, but I'm saying it with my life. When I go to God in prayer, I'm saying, God, I can't do this without you. I need you every hour of every day. Amen. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Prayerlessness is a manifestation of pride. Um, what about this one? Um, jobs that are beneath you. Jobs that are beneath you. You know what I'm talking about here? Ways, ways in which you may be called upon to serve ask to serve, or you just know somebody needs to do it, but you're like, that job's not for me. Um, now, let me tell you why I, th why I think this is a symptom of pride. Um, it's really hard to humiliate a humble man. It is. It's just hard to humiliate them. A humble person says, you know what? There's a way to serve. Let me do it. This is a good opportunity for me to serve. But the proud man says, you know what? I think that job's below me. You, you guys remember the disciples uh, on the last night? before Jesus was betrayed. Um, and Jesus, uh, you know, somebody needs to wash the feet. And, uh, and, and the disciples are all looking around. And they're like, you know, uh, it's not my job. You know, somebody else's job to do that. Now, all of them recognize that, that a little, 
some small part of their rank. They recognized that Jesus was greater than them. None of them wanted Jesus to be washing their feet because he's obviously greater than I am. But nobody volunteered. Nobody picked up the towel. Nobody stepped up to do it. Why? Because of pride. Because of pride. Jobs that are beneath us. Um, how about this? Uh, am I easily devastated or easily angered by criticism? When somebody tries to correct me and somebody criticizes something about me, am I easily devastated by that? Or am I easily angered by it? Um, if so, I need to ask myself why. There may, be, there may be an inflated ego. Let me add to that an inflated view of my gifts, my abilities, or just my importance. All right? Let me say something about this. I think this is, this is important. Um, there is no member of this congregation that is so important that without them, this congregation could not continue to do God's work. Amen. If the Lord was to strike me dead today, I have full confidence and faith that the Lord would continue to do great work through his people here in Brooklyn. Um, and that's true for every other member here in this church. Um, God doesn't need us to survive. God is quite capable of surviving on his own. And he's quite capable of doing his work. There's a song I used to sing growing up. Um, Christ has no hands but our hands. Um, and I understood the, sem the, the sentiment of the song was, hey, we need to be doing Christ's work in the world. God works through us. And that part is true. But I, I don't think it's actually true that Christ has no hands but our hands. He's got plenty of hands, and he's way stronger, and he doesn't need me to do his work. But sometimes we think like that, don't we? We think we're more important than we really are. Like my gifts, my abilities, my, my uh, influence is so critical um, to, to this church. Let me tell you this, uh, and this is encouragement to those of you who are humble. Your weaknesses will not hinder you from effectiveness in the kingdom of God if you believe the gospel. Only your delusion of strength will. God has a long history of his power being perfected in what? In weakness. God can work through the weak. The problem is that sometimes we are delusional and thinking that we are strong. And that is what is hindering us from being effective in our work in the gospel. So another manifestation of pride here, an inflated view of my gifts, my importance, my abilities. Uh, certainly God alone is the only one that we need. And, and, and all of us are subservient to him. Uh, all right, here's another one. This is convicting, especially up here. Checking the clock here on this one. Um, you talk too much. You talk too much, all right? Um, and uh, this is hard to say as a preacher who tends to go long. Um, but, hey, this is important for us to think about. Uh, sometimes what I say is important, especially if it's coming from the Word of God. Um, but when I'm in conversations and when I'm talking with other people, if I find myself always dominating every conversation, what does that say about me? What does that say about me? I think that what I have to say is more important than what everybody else has to say. Um, all right, and what is that? That's pride. That's, that's a symptom of pride. Uh, now, we need to be careful here. You know, there are times when people need to talk more, and there are times when people need to talk less, for sure. Um, but how good of a listener am I? Uh, am I always wanting to speak, or am I also willing to sit and, and, and listen? Um, manifestations of pride. Uh, how about this? Consumed with what everybody else thinks about me. Um, consumed with what everybody else thinks about me. The humble man is content to have the approval of God, even if nobody else approves of him. But the proud are always looking to have a good reputation around other people. If I'm consumed by what everybody else is thinking about me, um, they're, again, a symptom of pride. What about this? I, I, uh, a desire for an independent life. A desire for an independent life. Uh, I don't really need other people. I don't really need close relationships. I, I, you know, I might need to come to church, but I don't really need to be have people intimately involved in my life where I'm sharing my life with them. I don't need that. I can do this by myself. Um, uh, that's a symptom of what? That's a symptom of pride. That's me saying, I, I think I can do this on my own. And the Bible clearly says otherwise. What about this? I'm quick to minimize my sins while maximizing the sins of others. Oh, man, I can see it well in you. 
brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, man, look at, look at what she's doing wrong. And we're so good at that, right? We're so good, even in worship. This can be a danger, even in worship. You start to look around at your brothers and sisters, and you start to think about, hey, what about that brother? Why, is he, why isn't he you know, here more? Why isn't that sister more loving? Why didn't she greet me when she came in the door? You know, and we start to, start to look at things, and sometimes we take the smallest little thing in somebody else, and we make it big. We make it big. Like, wow, that's a huge problem. Look at how sinful that person is. Or look how messed up, how proud that person is. Meanwhile, over here, all of my problems, you know, they're small problems. They're not that big. You know, my sins, they're, they're not, they, I may have some problems, but they're, they're mostly, you know, they're mostly small, right? We judge ourselves differently sometimes than we judge other people. Uh, and wh where does that come from? It comes from pride. Uh, let me give you one more. Um, attention getting tactics. Um, you know, sometimes I just want to be the center of attention. I just want everybody to be looking at me. I want people to be talking, talking about me. I want people to be thinking about me. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get people's attention so that people make sure that I, they recognize how important I really am. These are just a few. There are so many more. Um, and, uh, and again, if you're feeling a bit convicted by that, uh, I'll just say join the club uh, myself as well. But the point of bringing these out is to recognize that as the people of God, we need to be fighting against this. We need to be working every day to recognize pride in our hearts and to, and to, and to root it out of our hearts. Realizing that it can morph and it can show up in different areas of life. Yeah, hopefully these few will help you to go and go before the Lord and say to God, search me, O God. Show me my heart. Give me today a, 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 a greater sense of my sinfulness in your presence, a greater sense of where pride has a hold on my heart. And Lord, strip me of my pride and humble me and help me to walk in the way that you called me to be. I pray that prayer. I'll, I'll also add, I sometimes pray that prayer, but only a, do, a daily dose. Because um, I don't know if the Lord was to show me everything, if I could handle it in one day. So, you know, Lord, give me just a little bit today to work on. But but we need to be recognizing and more cognizant of the ways in which pride takes a hold on us. And that's because of the danger of pride. It will destroy us. If it's not addressed, if it's not removed, it will destroy us. One of the sad things to me about this, this, this uh, message, and it may be the only one, Obadiah, that, that ends with really no note of hope for Edom at all. Did you notice that? I think it's kind of depressing. Now, it ends with a note of hope for God's people in Zion. There's a beautiful ending to Obadiah for the Israelites, for the people of, uh, of God. But man, um, it ends with this. Esau will be stubble. They will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors. Man, that's a painful, painful ending. Um, and so we need to be rooting out pride to make sure that this is not our end. Thank God that he's been merciful to us thus far. And he's brought us near to him. And we as his people who've been rescued by the grace and the humility of Jesus Christ our Lord should be moved now to pursue that same humility in our own hearts. So with that in mind, let's talk just for the last five minutes. I just want to share a few things um, that, that I believe the Bible stresses are, are keys to, to developing a humble heart. All right, and I, I mentioned this is an ongoing work. It's something that we must continue to do. But what are some habits of the humble? Let me give you five real quick. One is study the attributes of God. Study the attributes of God. As I learn more about who God is, I learn to see myself as I really am. I need to study the attributes of God. I'm doing this as I'm reading through the Psalms. Um, I'm trying to, to journal some, and I'll just start with God is. After I read the psalm, God is. And I'm writing down, what do I see in the psalm that God is? Because as I see God more clearly, you know what happens? I begin to see myself more clearly. You know, when I go to the Word, sometimes my, I am big and God is small. But as I read God's Word, God gets bigger and I get smaller. You understand what I mean by that. In my view, God gets bigger and I get smaller. And I am cut down to size. Apart from God, I do not exist. Apart from me... God does exist. He doesn't need me to exist. And so there's no more important question to ask than what is God like? Um, for us, life is lived between two hospitals. We come in in a hospital. We go out in a hospital. But God does not wither. He does not fade. He is not fragile. And the more I get to see God as he is, the more I will see myself rightly as I truly am. Secondly, um, serve and sacrifice in ways that cost you much and offer you little 
in return. All right? You want to you cultivate humility in your life? Then find ways to serve and to sacrifice that cost you a lot. That is, they're difficult for you. They're hard for you. But they offer you very little in return. This is the reversal of pride. Edom, when you read Obadiah, Edom saw people who were oppressed. They saw people who were disadvantaged. And what did they do? This is our chance. We're going to plunder them. We're going to pillage them. We're going to take advantage of them. This is the reversal of pride. You see people in need around you. You see people that are hard to help. And you, you don't run to take advantage of them. You run to help them. You run to serve them. You run to, you run to be there for them in their times of need. Serve and sacrifice in ways that cost you a lot, but offer you little in return. Thirdly, um, pray, pray, pray. With humble postures, pray. All right, let me say what, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, one, if I want to be humble, getting in the presence of God is going to humble me. So, getting in the presence of God and talking to God, if I have, if I'm cognizant of who He is, that will humble me. But, but, let me add to that too. The Bible teaches us different postures that we can use that help us to humble ourselves before God. Sometimes in scripture, you'll see people when they're praying standing. Out of respect, um, whenever someone important comes in the room, what do we do? We oftentimes we get up to say hi to them, to, as a sign of respect. You stand, um, and so prayer sometimes it'd be good for me. I'm praying. Maybe you not know, just sit here, like it's like I'm just casually talking to a friend. But let me stand up and show respect for God. Or how about lying prostrate on the ground, acknowledging my unworthiness before God and telling God how unworthy I am to be in his presence. Or how about lifting my hands in prayer to say, God, I need you. I cannot do this without you. Apart from you, I am nothing. Or how about kneeling as a sign of submission that I am standing, I am coming before my king. I am bowing down in reverence. These are postures that teach my body and my heart and my soul and my mind who I am before the Lord. And so prayer is an important habit for the humble, but also praying with humble postures. All right, the fourth one, and this is just a preview for what is coming in our Proverbs study, um, invite and pursue correction. Invite and pursue correction. And I just want to say this, it's better to be humbled now than to be humiliated forever. Isn't that right? Better to be humbled now than to be humiliated forever. So when people come to correct me and when people come to, 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 to help me to get back on the right path, I need to invite that. I need to pursue that. I need to want that in my life. And I need to make myself available, accessible, and have the kind of spirit that people will want to do that. They'll want to, they'll want to correct. They'll want to, uh, to, to help me in the ways that I need to grow. All right, lastly. So we've got study the attributes of God. Serve and sacrifice in ways that cost you much and offer you little in return. Pray with humble postures. Invite and pursue correction. And there are many more, but I'm just going to leave you with this one. Every day we need to survey the cross, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Every day we need to survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Nothing cuts me down to size like standing near the cross of Christ. Nothing helps me to see myself as I truly am, like standing near the cross of Christ. Though he nested among the stars, he came down, laid aside his heavenly garments, took up the towel to wash the feet of his disciples, went to the cross, the death died the death of a criminal, so that by his grace, I might have life. So that he could take me, who was lowest of the low, lowly of lowlies, and he could raise me up to be with him and to live with him forevermore. Nothing cuts me down to size like surveying the cross. And, and think about this. How do we know as Obadiah ends, it ends with this truth and this beautiful, this beautiful promise that deliverers are going to go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. But how do we know that the kingdom will be the Lord's? How do we know that the kingdom is the Lord's? And this is how we know. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He suffered and died on the cross. The cross proves the depth of his humility, and the grave proves the, 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 the heights of his exaltation. 
God took, sent Jesus to the cross to die in my place. And sent, when he raised Jesus up, he proved that God really will take those who are lowly and he will make them lofty. And he really will take those who are lofty and he will make them lowly. And so we as his people stay near the cross so that we can be cut down to size and appreciate, appreciate who we are in light of God's glory, in light of God's goodness, in light of God's holiness, and in light of his loving kindness, which never ends. The kingdom is the Lord's, and the day of the Lord is coming for all of us. The question is, what kind of people will we be when the Lord returns? What kind of people will we be when he comes back to receive us home? And my prayer is for each of us that it will never be said of us that the pride of our hearts has deceived us. And that when it is true of us that the pride of our hearts has deceived us, that the Lord would reveal that to us and that we would repent of it quickly and humble ourselves before him. Shall we pray together? Oh God, our Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for Obadiah, for what he taught us in this short book. Um, forgive us, Father, for how often we are, uh, our lives are wrecked with pride. Forgive us for the times in which we've exalted ourselves, dwelling in the clefts of the rock and living in the heights and thinking about how that we are secure. Lord, humble us in your presence this morning. Help us to see ourselves as we truly are. And I pray for each one of us, Lord, that you give us a spirit that desires to work diligently and that you help us to have perseverance in attacking pride in our own hearts and in our own lives um, and that we'll replace it with humility. Lord, you have shown us the way. You are the God of the towel. You are the God who left, laid aside your heavenly garments and took up the towel to, uh, to wash our feet and to suffer and die in our place. So teach us, Lord, to take up the towel and to follow in your footsteps, to become servants so that pride would not grip our heart, but we would be the ones that you can look upon, those who are lowly, those who are humble, those who are contrite. We thank you for your word today. We pray that it would not fall on deaf ears. We pray that our ears, our hearts would be open to receive it and to change in all the ways that we need to to repent of our wickedness and to turn to you with a whole heart. In Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Page 8. Pass me not, for gentle Savior. Psalm 61. Pass me not, O gentle Savior.
Psalm 117, please. Psalm 117. Come for the time for us to take the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup together. If you're here with us today and you're not a Christian, you haven't been baptized into Christ, the, this, uh, and maybe you're not even familiar with the Christian faith very much, uh, this is probably maybe one of the stranger parts of our time together. Uh, the songs, the reading, the prayers, those in some ways are pretty standard across a lot of religious activity. But this is very unique, and it's for really only uh, Christians, those who have been baptized into Christ to participate in. Um, and it's, besides it being strange, it, it may be the most important part of why we come together. So that we can remember why all the stuff we're doing matters. Why our whole lives even um, can exist. Because of Jesus' death on the cross. The blood that he gave to secure our salvation. Through his resurrection where now he reigns in heaven at the right hand of God. And so he instructed us to take the bread and the cup and so we're doing that. I'd like to share a couple thoughts to help us to prepare for that. I guess our theme is... Um, short passages today. I think this is the shortest chapter in the Bible, I'm pretty sure. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol Him, all peoples. That's a really significant uh, call, charge. And pretty strange. Maybe I should read that a little bit better. Praise Yahweh, all nations. I'm a Philistine. We praise Dagon. I'm a Canaanite. We praise Baal. I'm a Greek. We praise Zeus. I'm a capitalist. We praise money. I'm a communist. We praise the state. You know what I'm saying? Like, There's all these gods that all these different nations and peoples have. But this passage says, stop it. With all the other gods. Praise Yahweh. All nations. Extol him. All peoples. Why? For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of Yahweh endures forever. Praise the Lord. Why is it that all peoples should praise him, should honor him, should extol him, should revere him? Why is that? He gives two words that are kind of saying in some ways the same thing. The first one there in verse 2 is, For great is his steadfast love. Or yours may say mercy or loving kindness or loyal love or faithful love. The idea of this word is that... Uh, not just that God feels good feelings toward us, or even that He does loving things toward us, but that He's steadfast in it. Mm. And that steadfastness is rooted in His promise, His covenant. He said He would, mm. and He never breaks it. Once He says that He'll do something for His people, He always follows through. Which is why kind of the rhyming idea, may not be a rhyming in sound, but the rhyming idea is in the next line. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Whenever he says something, he means it. He's sticking with it. He's always going to do it. 
This is why whenever Jesus Christ came into the world in the Gospel of John, really John says pretty much this exact same thing. He says, whenever we looked at Jesus, we beheld the glory of God. He was full of steadfast love, grace, and truth, faithfulness. That's what truth means, by the way. If you say something and you actually do it, you told the truth. God, what makes him special, what makes him unique, what makes him worth remembering and praising and worshiping and devoting ourselves to is how consistent he is. Yesterday morning, I walked out of the house, and I had to put on a sweater, and then I had a jacket. But then within a few hours, that was a wrong decision. And so then I had to take the thing off and put another thing on. And then, and then that evening, I was out, sitting at a restaurant, outside on the patio, perfect. And then, by the way, by this time, I'd already put the sweater back on and the jacket back on. But then, and it was nice out there, until the sun peaked right, I mean, it was just like barely behind that building, and then I had to go inside. We had to go inside to eat. Totally inconsistent. And that silly little thing about weather is emblematic of all of life here. And certainly, whenever we start getting involved with each other, people that we think we can trust, who could save us, who could fix us, who could change our life and our destiny, totally unreliable, totally inconsistent. Praise the Lord that His steadfast love is always sticking with us. That his faithfulness endures forever. Here's how the book of Hebrews says it. The Hebrew writer helps us see how the glory of God is expressed in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews 1 and verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. That steadfast love and faithfulness that endures forever, that radiates out of Jesus. And as we're here today to honor Him, to remember Him in taking the bread and the cup, we're reflecting upon the fact that He has established and fully proven God's steadfast love and His faithfulness. He's the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And after making purification for sins, listen to this line. He sat down at the right hand of God. I don't think that's just a little note. Be like, just in case you were wondering where Jesus went, that's where he is. The idea that he sat down is bigger than that. It signifies that, well, what Jesus said when he was on the cross, you remember? It is finished. It's secured. It's done. It's set. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read a couple things just to help us think about what what does this mean? Okay, good. God is gracious and he means it when he promises. God is faithful, but what does that mean? As we take the bread and as we take the cup, what is it actually supposed to lead us to understand or to appreciate about what Jesus' death has meant for us? I want to read and just highlight these things. And then I'm going to ask Roger, if he would, to offer prayer for the bread, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask Mike to offer prayer. Excuse me, Tim. Um, I was with the wrong guy. Uh, Tim, if you don't mind offering prayer for the cup, that'd be all right. <laughs> Hebrews 10, verse 12 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We're right there in that. There's no changing. There's no updating. The steadfast love, the faithfulness of God has been expressed most fully in the death of Christ. And there's no need for more sacrifices. And you can know it's secure because he's right there at the right hand of God. All right, what does it mean for us? Number one, verse 13. Waiting for that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. What we remember when we remember the death of Christ is that all of God's enemies will be defeated. That means all of our enemies, if we're with the Lord, will be defeated. Satan, who keeps on getting after you every day, trying to get you to fall into temptation, he's going to be defeated one day. This, the brokenness of this world where the creation's crumbling around us all the time, that's going to be eradicated. God's going to fix it. That enemy's going to be defeated. The great enemy, death, one day 
We already can go ahead and start singing it because we know it's going to happen. But one day we're going to see it come true. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? All his enemies will be defeated. Know that and remember that as we take the bread and the cup. Verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We usually think about the word of perf perfect or perfection looking backwards. I'm not perfect. Let me look backwards. The Bible doesn't use the word perfect in that way. Perfection uh, in the Bible speaks about the end result. To, be, to come to completion, to come to fruition, to come to what you are supposed to be, to be a grown-up. As we take the bread and the cup, we're reminded of the surety that we know that we're being perfected and we will be perfect. As imperfect as we feel, it doesn't matter how we feel, as imperfect as we know we are right now as we walk around in this world, we know we've been sanctified and we are being sanctified and God is perfecting us in Jesus Christ. Whatever imperfections, whatever flaws, whatever shortcomings, whatever weaknesses, whatever immaturities you have, in Jesus Christ, they will be made complete. They will be made perfect. And we know that because the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord in Jesus Christ endures forever. Verse 15, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. He actually said at the beginning that uh, God had to only kind of give parts of all of his ways for a long time, but no more. God's ways are secure. God's ways are sure. We know. We know what God expects of us. We know what God wants from us. We know what God's doing in our lives and among us and where he's taken us. His word is something we know is true and that we can hold on to. And as we're in this world lost and confused, and I don't know, maybe right now you feel mostly lost and confused with what's going on in your life. The death of Christ and his resurrection that reminds us of the steadfast love and faithfulness of God says, hey, are you paying attention to the stuff God said? Because if you would, you're going to be all right. Because you can trust it. It's consistent. It's reliable. It's secure. Verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Last thing that Jesus proves to us, or the last reason why it matters that Jesus has proven to us the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. You are forgiven. If you're here and you're in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. He's not going to go back on that. Mm -hmm. Like so many of us do whenever we forgive. Mm -hmm. He's not going to change his mind because actually you did some really bad stuff. And you did. But he said, I remember it no more. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there's no longer any offering for it. There's nothing to offer for. Your record's been wiped clean. And so as you take the bread and remember the body of Jesus that was given to bring about the forgiveness of your sins. Remember also as we take the cup, the blood of his covenant, how sure that covenant is. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For his steadfast love and his faithfulness endures forever. Amen. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Amen. Roger, pray for us for the bread, please. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come before you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, Father. Even when we are not faithful, you remain faithful. Amen. Father, we thank you for your Son who made this sacrifice for us. 
as much as we did not deserve it. You see it fit. Father, we thank you. As we take this bread, we reflect the sacrifice you made, our Father. Help us remember you loved us before we even were born. Thank you, Father, for your love. And thank you for your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. God, as we continue our uh, thoughts on this, take us back to the sacrifice that was made. We're mindful of this cup, which represents your blood, which was shed for us on the cross. And that makes significance that it has in our days, each day of our life and our decisions. And as now as we think of the sacrifice that was made, may we take this in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable and remember what you did for us every day of our lives. Amen. We have some people among us that are sick. Please let's be praying for them. Uh, Lauren and Caitlin are sick. Brother Philip. Um, let's also keep praying for Brittany's mom, Caleb's grandma, Ruth's mom, and our brother Billy. Let's also pray for Lindsay. She's due next Monday, right, Caleb? That everything goes well. Um, also... Omni is officially a member, so you know, reach out to her if you haven't already done so. Um, next Sunday, then um, the holes are going to be out of town, so let's be praying for that as well. Um, regarding the retreat, today I think is the last day. If you are interested in going, reach out to our sister Rachel. And um, Marina's grandfather passed away last night, so uh, let's also keep them praying, and as well for Brother Moses, that everything that he needs to do to reunite with his wife might go smoothly. Um, there's also a declaration box. If you're busy and do not feel obligated, um, the members, be aware of that. And um, yeah, after the prayer, we're going to take a 15 minute break. And then we have the class. Uh, let us pray. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness, your faithfulness, and all the mercy that you have shown us through your Son, Christ. We want to pray, Father, for the members of our church who are sick. We want to pray for Lauren and Caitlin, Philip and Billy. Um, and for those who might be that I um, forgot to mention, 
We also want to pray for Brittany's mom, for Caleb's grandma, and for Ruth's mom. Give their families strength to be able to go and endure all these trials that they're going through right now, Lord. And we pray that you might um, have mercy on them and heal them, Father. Um, be your will done, not ours, though. Um, we also want to pray for Lindsay and Gaziah that everything might go well um, on the next Monday. And we also want to uh, give you thanks, Lord, because Omni is now part of the congregation and she's been um, following you. Father, we're grateful for that. We also want to pray for the holes that in uh, the trip that they're taking that they might go and come back safely that everything goes according to plan and that wherever they go um, they may be able or to honor you there as well um, we also want to pray for Moses that everything that he's going through all the things that he's doing with his home with his wife that everything might be um, might be resolved soon in, in, in a fruitful manner, Lord, that he can be reunited with his wife. And we thank you because even though he hasn't been together with her that much, he's been working diligently, Father. And we also want to pray for Sister Marina. Um, you know, and we knew that when she would leave, things would be hard. Um, now, a loss in the family is probably not something that we were expecting, Lord, so give her strength. You know, she just um, moved recently, so uh, it may be a especially vulnerable moment for her, since a lot of her closest friends are not there with her. Give her strength, Lord, give her wisdom to her and her family, and that um, this might just result in her having a closer relationship with you. We praise you, Father, for all the goodness and because you always take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs>